share for, just want to welcome everybody online and in person. I'm going to share for about 30 to 35 minutes. Dad's going to share for 30 minutes, and we're going to, this is the two witnesses coming at you here. Uh, just kidding, but uh, just, just really the, the Lord gave us both a, a burden to, to share, and so I just, I just want to talk today about what we're sensing the Lord is, is speaking today. Um, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Revelation chapter 3, verse 1. We want to get a sense of, just that's the heart of this, is we want to get a sense of what is the Holy Spirit saying to the church. And, you know, one of the things I, I really think is important is as we head into a new year, one of the things that I think is really, really important is we pause and we say, okay, Lord, what is the Spirit saying to the church? And this is not what has become popular in the charismatic circles of, okay, what is, what is, the, what is the prediction for 2023? If you've been in that enough, you've seen, okay, this is the year 2020 vision. You know, how did that work out? <laughs> not very well. This is the year 2020 vision. This is the year breakthrough. This is the year when, you know, the wealth of the nation is going to be transferred. So this is not what that is. This is not what, this is not my heart in carrying this message. My heart in carrying this message today is that we would get a sense, okay, Lord, what is the Spirit saying to the church? What is the Spirit saying to this church as we head into 2023? And most likely it's not going to be predictive. And, and so I think a lot of times that in the charismatic church, we think prophecy is always predictive. Prophecy is not always predictive. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, 3 uh, says that prophecy is for exhortation comfort and edification. Prophecy is to exhort you. So, you know, I, I think we make a big mistake thinking that, okay, 2023 is going to be the year of, it's almost become like fortune-telling prophecy or something. You know, it's like, you know, what's in the fortune cookie? You know, that's not what this is. This is, okay, Lord, the, the, the true spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus Christ. It is a, it is a revelation of Jesus Christ. It is a call to the church to, to see the Lord as he is. It's a call to the church to get into alignment with what is the Spirit saying to the church in this hour? What is the Spirit saying to the church in this hour in which we live? What is the Holy Spirit saying to the church? That is really what I want this, this message to be. I believe this is the, the heart of God. I, I believe that, I, I hope and I pray, I believe, that we are carrying that, that, that the Lord has give us, given us this burden of what is the Spirit saying to the church as we head into 2023. I remember back in 2020, the Lord had me do that, and I preached two messages called the Decade of Decades. And in that message, I said that, that the 2020s, this, I'm going to just read this, the 2020s will be the most defining decade in our lifetime. That no man, our spiritual father, used to say that we are in a season of seasons and a time of times. And I said, I believe 2020 to 2029 is a decade of decades. And I still believe that. I would, I would agree. How many of you would agree? That seems like we're living in that, doesn't it? Uh, that 20, the 2020s will lead us to a quantum leap forward toward the return of the Lord. And this decade could be the most accelerated decade we have ever experienced. What takes place during these next 10 years could very well establish the foundation for the second coming of Jesus Christ. I still believe that. I still believe that. The 2020s will take a quantum leap forward to the full maturing of evil and righteousness. We will experience the best of times and the worst of times at the same time. That was in January of 2020. When everyone, I'm not trying to draw attention to myself, but when everyone was saying, hey, 2020 is going to be the year of 2020 vision, <laughs> and then COVID hits three months later. Now we're entering into the, the fourth year of the decade of decades. And my heart is to, is to share what I believe and what dad believes is the, uh, the spirit of prophecy, the testimony of Jesus, what the spirit is saying to the church. That's our heart. That's our prayer. That's our desire. So let's go ahead and let's turn to Revelation chapter 3. 
Now, as I share this, I just want to make sure, I want to clarify this, that I'm not saying that the that restoration life is in a condition to, as like the church of Sardis. Praise God. We're not in that condition. I do not believe the Lord is saying that. But there's some things in this passage of Scripture that are very important for us to understand, for the Spirit to highlight. And so I just want to read, I just want to read the, the Lord's message to the church of Sardis. To the angel of the church in Sardis, write, he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars says this, I know your deeds, that you have a name that you are alive, but you are dead. And again, I don't believe the Lord is saying we are dead. Now, some people may be, but I don't believe overall the Lord is saying that to us. But I do believe the Lord is saying verse 2 to us. In, in the midst of all that is going on in these times in which we live, it's time to really wake up. Amen? Amen. We are living in a time in which I, I believe we are living in the end times. I believe we are heading towards the day of the Lord, the return of the Lord. And the, the word of the Lord to us is wake up. Wake up. Strengthen the things that remain which were about to die. For I have not found your deeds completed in the sight of my God. So remember what you have received and heard and keep it and repent. Now, just let me, let me pause just for a second and just say a little bit of historical background to the Church of Sardis. The Church of Sardis, if you don't know this, the Church of Sardis, and I think about 549 B.C., Sardis was located on a plateau about 1,500 feet uh, high, and everyone thought, okay, th this, this city is almost impossible to, to conquer. But yet the Persians in 549 B.C., when the, when the, when the, when the people of Sardis were asleep, even though there's history that says they saw the Persians down below, and they said there's, and basically they said there's no way they're going to be able to scale up this mountain. We are absolutely undefeatable, and complacency set in, and the, and the people of Sardis went to sleep that night, and they woke up unexpectedly conquered by the Persians in 549 B.C. That's, that's the context that the Lord is speaking to the church of Sardis. So when the Lord says, wake up, it had an incredible amount of relevance to the church of Sardis because the reason they were conquered is because they fell asleep, they grew complacent, they grew apathetic, and they thought we will never ever be defeated, we will never be overcome. Their complacency led to their apathy, to their sleepiness, to their slumber, and they missed they were not awake when the enemy came. <clears throat> amen. Liam's saying amen. I like it. He's already saying amen to his uncle. All right. This is, then, the, then the Lord says, if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief. And we know from the Gospels he would come like a thief in the night. That had a lot of relevance to the church of Sardis because, again, they were conquered at night when they fell asleep. And so the Lord is, is warning Sardis that he's coming like a thief. He's coming like a thief in the night. And you will not know at what hour he comes. Verse 4. But you have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their garments, and they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He who overcomes will thus be clothed in white garments, and I will not erase his name from the book of life, and I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. That's really the, the heart of my heart for this, is that God, would you give us the ability to hear what the Spirit of God is saying to the church and to this church. And so again... What I'm saying is that this is not, a, we're not, a, restoration life is not like the church of Sardis, but there are some parallels that I want to highlight just real quick of what I believe the Lord is saying is, is it's so easy living in America when we have lived for decades and decades and decades of prosperity and blessing and security and success for us to be lulled to sleep and say that could, you know, nothing bad could ever happen to this country it's so easy for that attitude to creep in to the church and for us to become spiritually affected by the culture around us, 
and the blessing of God in America where we grow complacent and we're lulled to spiritual sleep. And I believe that's a word to us is don't fall asleep. Wake up. Wake up. The second thing I, I feel like that just, just in, in the midst of this is God was calling, in the midst of the church of Sardis, there, was, there were those who were living as overcomers. The Lord said, I have a few that have not soiled their garments. And even in this church, I believe there's, there's a good number of people that are living as overcomers. And, you know, there's some that, that still need to wake up, that still need to get on that path of overcoming. And I believe that the Lord is saying it's time to wake up. It's time to get ready for the hour of history that you live in. The next thing is I believe the church of Sardis, when, when the Lord said, I'm coming like a thief in the night, he was, he was, he was, I believe he was both, both speaking to the church of Sardis, warning them of judgment coming to that church. Now, I don't believe judgment's coming to this church. I mean, there's always the biblical principle of judgment begins in the house of God. But they were under direct threat of the Lord's judgment because of their, their sleepiness and their compromise. I don't believe that that's the case for us. But, but, the, but not only was they, were they in, under a threat of the Lord's judgment, but they were also a prototype, and this is where it relates to us, they were a prototype of the end time church. They were a prototype. So when the Lord said, I'm coming like a thief, it was both to that local church in judgment and it was related to the end time church of whom Sardis was a prototype of those of the church who grew complacent and apathetic and sleepy and fell asleep as the Lord's second coming was nearing. Does that make sense? So when, when the Lord talks about, I'm going to talk about this in a second, but just in summary, let me just summarize it this way. Jesus is, there's three things. Jesus is coming like a thief in the night. What that means is, it doesn't mean he's coming and the church is going to be taken away into a secret rapture. That's not what it means. I'm not going to go into all that right now. It means that it, it, it's a reference to the day of the Lord and the day of the Lord coming in judgment. And so what the Lord is saying here, that, that Jesus is coming like a thief in the night to judge the church. Judgment begins in the house of God. We are witnessing that around the world right now, even as we speak. Judgment is beginning in the house of God. And may we get our hearts right. Lord, get our hearts right. I believe that, that not only is judgment beginning in the house of God, judgment is coming to this nation. In fact, judgment is already on this nation. Read Romans chapter 1, 18 through 32, and tell me if that does not describe what is happening in America right now. God's first act of judgment is to hand us over to our own selves and not restrain us from getting what we want. And that, we, in other words, God says, I'm going to hand you over and I'm going to give you what you want. And he hands us over and we fall into degrading passions. And we move from degrading passions to actually celebrating what God calls an abomination and ostracizing those who don't tolerate it. Um, that's the condition of this nation. And if you read that, it describes America perfectly that says America is right now under the wrath of God. We're, it's not, now, does that mean more judgment is coming to this nation? Yes. But it also means this nation is already being judged by the Lord. It really is. And I think a lot of us know that, but it's, you know, that's the, the judgment of the Lord is coming and it's also coming to the nations. That's why, number two, we need to wake up. I need to wake up. I need to wake up. Okay, God help me. Help me wake up. We need to wake up. And then the third thing is, I believe the Lord's saying out of this, is that we need to strengthen the local church. We need to strengthen this local church. That's the word of the Lord to Sardis is, I am coming like a thief in the night. Basically, strengthen the local church. The local church is essential for the day we live in. The local church is so vital, so vital. The Gathering together, it's like the Lord said, or Hebrews talks about, do not forsake the assembling together, especially as that day comes closer. 
He's talking about the day in which we live, the end times, the second coming of Jesus Christ, the day of the Lord. As that day approaches, it's even more important not to forsake the assembling together of the local body of Christ, the ecclesia. So I'm going to talk about that next week. But, but I just want to go into, just for a second, just talking about this theme of a thief in the night. And you know in Matthew chapter 24, 43 through 44, so I just, I'm just going to list out a couple, just a few scripture references where the Lord talks about or, or the apostles talk about a thief in the night. It's Matthew 24, 43 through 44. Luke 12, 39 through 40. 1 Thessalonians 5, 2 through 4. Am I going too fast? Okay, let me try it again. Okay, Matthew 24, 43 through 44. I want to encourage you to go read these. So Matthew 24, 43 through 44. Luke 12, 39 through 40. 1 Thessalonians 5, 2 through 4. 2 Peter 3, 10, Revelation 3, 3, 2 Peter 3, 10, Revelation 3, 3, Revelation 3, 3, my, my family gets on to me because I repeat things all the time, but now she's telling me to repeat it, Revelation 3, 3, Revelation 16, 15. Revelation 16, 15, that those are the passages where the Lord talks about, or the, Jesus or the apostles talk about the Lord coming like a thief in the night. Now, I don't, I don't know what your background is, but I remember as probably a middle schooler, and we were in the, the, the Baptist church, and I re, I'll never forget this, it scarred my soul, but... We, they showed us this movie called A Thief in the Night. I don't know if anyone else remembers that movie. Man, it put, it put fear in me. Not really the fear of God. It put fear in me. Basically, that Jesus was going to come like a thief in the night, and that meant a secret rapture, and that everyone, if you didn't get saved, then you know, you're know you going to get your head chopped off or whatever. I mean, it just like traumatized me. I just remember that. But anyway, I don't know if anyone has that similar experience. But anyway, that is really not what... This, I don't believe that the Lord coming as a thief in the night means a secret rapture of the church. I believe what it means is the Lord is coming uh, in judgment, and he's going to come unexpectedly. It's like in the days of Noah. In the days of Noah, the people had no idea what was going on. Noah did. He had prophetic insight. And it, it is so vital that in the times we live in that we have that ability to hear the voice of the Lord. Because if Noah did not hear the voice of the Lord, he would have been swept away in the judgment as well. We need to hear what is the Lord saying, what is the Lord speaking, because this is an hour when hearing the voice of God is no longer charismatic entertainment. Hearing the voice of the Lord is for our very survival. We've got to hear the true word of the Lord in this day in which we live. Amen? And so, anyway, the, that when, when the Lord says, I'm coming like a thief in the night, he's coming in judgment for the unprepared and the unexpected, unexpected, those who are not expecting or anticipating it happening. See, what happened in the days of Noah, judgment came, and nothing like that had ever happened in history. And the Lord says, his coming will be just like the days of Noah. His coming will be just like the days of Noah. Now, in 1 Thessalonians 5, uh, 2 through 4, Paul says the day of the Lord is like a thief in the night. See, when Jesus said, I'm coming like a thief in the night, Paul gives us greater clarity to tell us that does not mean, that does not mean his, that his, a secret rapture. It does not mean even necessarily immediately his second coming. It means the day of the Lord and all that represents is coming like a thief in the night. And here's, how, here's a real simple way to think of the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord begins in Revelation chapter 6 when the Lamb breaks the sixth seal. And you can read about it, but it's when the, blood, when the moon turns dark and the, and the moon turns to blood. The, the sun turns dark and the moon turns to blood. And, and, the, and the people cry out, who, who is able to stand in that day? That is when the day of the Lord begins in Revelation chapter 6. 
on the breaking of the sixth seal. And then the, the day of the Lord includes that seal all the way through the seven trumpet judgments, all the way through the seven bowls of wrath. Happy New Year. <laughs> Aren't you glad you came to church today to hear about the Lord's judgments? We need to hear, honestly. These kind of things have been out, have not been preached in the church for so long, and the church is weaker because of it. Now, I don't mean we may, all we ever preach on is the judgment of the Lord, but we've got to really, we've got to talk about it. A lot of the church is embarrassed. A lot of the church is embarrassed that God would do these things. And the church is weaker for it. We become soft. So the day of the Lord is the sixth seal plus the seven trumpets plus the seven bowls of wrath, wrath plus the millennial kingdom plus the final judgment before the new heavens and the new earth. So that's what, when the Lord says, I'm coming like a thief in the night, basically what he means, he's going to initiate all that's going to transpire uh, that, that precedes his, his, his physical coming to the earth. It's going to also include his coming, his millennial reign, and then what happens after his millennial reign. So it's, it's basically, you can think of it as the requirements necessary for the transition to the next age. So that's what, that's what the Lord is saying. I'm coming like a thief in the night, but, I, but if you're not awake and if you're not prepared, it's going to, you're going to suffer the consequences of it. Therefore, wake up. So let me just explain this here. Is this okay? I don't want to depress you, but we need to hear these things. I believe as we enter... 2023, the Lord seems to be warning us and the church in the nations that the birth pains of the end times are here. I wholeheartedly believe that COVID and all that we experienced under COVID was an end time birth pain. I, I, I wholeheartedly believe that. And will be increasing in frequency and intensity. Now, what we got to understand, and I, I've called this message the perfect storm. What we're living in right now is the perfect storm. It's the perfect storm of Satan's rage. It's the perfect storm of man's sin reaching fullness. And it's the perfect storm of God's judgment. We've got to understand this. We've got to understand this or else we're going to be, we're going to be confused about all that's taking place. We're going to be confused about the perfect storm that's brewing. I believe this perfect storm is right now on the horizon. You can see it out there at sea, and it's rapidly moving on towards shore. So Satan's rage. Satan is going to do anything and everything he can do to hinder and stop the Lord's second coming. Because he knows, Revelation chapter 20, he knows when the Lord comes, he's going to the bottomless pit for a thousand years and then to hell forever. There is a demonic strategy in the powers of darkness and the gates of hell that are trying to weaken the nations, bring in gross immorality, bring in darkness, to, and ultimately to compromise the bride of Christ so Jesus will be delayed again in his coming. So there's the rage of Satan. Revelation 12 talks about Woe to the earth and to the sea, because the devil has come down to you with great wrath, knowing his time is short. That hasn't happened yet, but we're moving towards that time. So we've got that dynamic that's going on, and I believe you can see the, in, the intensity of demonic strategy has heightened like I've never seen it before. Happy New Year. You got man's sin. See, the scriptures talk about, this is a biblical principle, that God waits... This is, a, this is the heart of God. God waits to release judgment until the sin of a people, a nation, a culture, the nations have ripened unto fullness. You can read about it in Genesis chapter 15, verse 16, where the Lord told Abraham is that your, your people are going to go into captivity or into slavery for 400 years, and I'm going to wait until the sin of the Amorite has become complete. In other words, you can read about that in Leviticus 18 when it's just some not very pleasant reading, but the sin of the Amorite is complete. In other words, when sin reaches fullness, then God brings his judgment, which is also his justice. You can read about it in Daniel 8.23 that 
in the fullness of time, in the end times, iniquity will run its course. Iniquity will reach fullness. You can read about it in Revelation 17, 14, that the harlot Babylon, she had a golden cup full of abominations. And so that's the, that is what the Lord says, that deep darkness is coming, lawlessness is increasing. We know this. I mean, we're living right through. You can, just, you can see it right before our eyes. This is not prophetic. This is just looking at what's going on in the culture in the nations is happening right before us. But, it, you know, just to just, just, just give you the understanding of where we are. Sin ripening unto fullness. Sin maturing unto completeness. Uh, and then the third dynamic is God's judgments. It's, again, it's a topic the church is embarrassed about. It's a topic the church does not want to discuss. Is that before the Lord returns, or in other words, in God's, in, in, the, in the cycle of the way God moves, and this is, this is from Genesis to Revelation, God waits patiently. God wants to bring about repentance. God wants to turn people, culture, a nation back to him. God is an, a, a father with a, with a jealous heart for his people, the people he created to turn back to him. He's, he's a jealous God. He's not quick. He's, in fact, a lot of people could even say, Lord, where is your justice? The Lord is slow in anger. The Lord is slow to release his judgment. And he begins, like Romans chapter 1 talks about, he begins by first releasing his judgment in the form of, of saying, I'm going to, if you want this, I'm going to give it to you. I'm not going to restrain myself from holding you back. If you want this lust and these lusts, if you want to exchange the worship of the creature for the creator, for the, you want to exchange the worship of the creator for the creature, if you want to get into, get into that place, I'm going to hand you over to what you want. And it moves into to, to degrading passions that are, that are even unspeakable, unmentionable. That's what Romans is saying. And then finally, God is, is like, you know, he, he, gives you, he gives a nation, he gives a culture over to what they want. That, this causes the cycle. As a result, that allows the powers of darkness to have greater entry into a nation, into a culture, into a people which then means God's judgment has to go to an entirely different level unless there is repentance. That means the intensity and the frequency of God's judgment has to increase if there's not repentance. The problem, in, the problem we then becomes is because sin hardens to such a degree that it almost becomes impossible for a nation, for a people to repent. But God, now I do believe we're coming into a, I do believe God is going to pour out, I believe this with all of my heart, Joel chapter 2, we are going to have the greatest outpouring of the Holy Spirit in history before the Lord returns. I'm not convinced that's going to change and transform the culture. It didn't in, in first century Rome. I don't believe it's going to happen. I personally don't believe that's going to happen. I mean, I, I, I hope it does, but... I'm not, you know, I, I'm very suspicious of that. Some, some people are very adamant that a great revival is going to come that's going to transform the culture. Hopefully it does. I'm all for it. If it happens, I say praise God. But my point is we've got to prepare as we pray for a great revival, as we pray for a great outpouring of the Holy Spirit, we also have to prepare for this perfect storm of Satan's rage, man's sin, and God's judgment coming unto fullness at the end of the age. We've got to prepare for that. And so it's in that context, I believe the Lord spoke to us, Isaiah 26, 20, last Sunday, go into, the, go into your inner rooms, shut the door until indignation passes. That was given to us by, by two or three people last Sunday, independently, when we waited on the Lord. Lord, what are you speaking? What are you saying? I believe that is what the Lord is saying, is that there is coming judgment to America. There is coming judgment to the nations. There is coming judgment to the church. And that, that what God is looking for in his people is for us to go into that prayer closet, into that inner chamber, into that holy of holy relationship with him 
to dine with him, to really know him. And I would say to really get equipped to live by the indwelling life of Jesus Christ. That's why you know, this series we're going through, we're going to get back into it in February. That's why this series we're going through, learning how to live by the indwelling life of Christ, is so vital because that is preparing us for these things that are coming. All right? So I want to make sure we're prepared. I want to make sure spiritually we are ready. So in summary, in summary then, you still with me? In summary, I believe the Lord is speaking to us. Jesus is coming like a thief in the night to judge the church, to judge America, and to judge the nations. Okay, that's true. That's scriptural. You can look at scripture. You can look at what's going on in this nation. You see, that is, that is absolutely unavoidable without repentance. And there's no sign whatsoever right now of there being repentance. That, that is... A clear, clear sign. The second thing is we need to wake up. Okay, so dad's going to come in a second and talk about some mindsets that we need to overcome that's going to help us to wake up. In other words, there's some mindsets, some attitudes that we can easily develop that keeps us in that state of being asleep, that state of being in slumber. And then the third thing, and I'm going to talk about this next Sunday, is that, that, the, that in, the, in the times in which we live, in the times in which we live, the local church is essential, and we need to strengthen the local church for this local church to be what God wants it to be at the end of the age so we can complete our mission and mandate to make the church ready. Amen. So the second witness is coming up. No, I'm kidding. Do you want to speak with the uh, handheld or with this microphone? Okay. Okay. He doesn't want any germs I might have. <laughs> All right, let's give everybody give Brian an amen. 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 Let me get set up here. Got my scriptures printed out in size font, sixteen font, ready to ready to be able to read them. <laughs> uh, amen. Um, I was trying to kind of see how to flow with this um, uh, in, in light of what Brian was saying and what we're uh, sensing the, the Lord is saying for, uh, for this year. Uh, what, here's kind of the theme of what I want to uh, lead from based on what Brian said and what we sense the Lord is saying and what kind of what we, want, we, what I, we sense that we all need to do. What, this is what the, the way the Lord put it to me is that he spoke to, to me and was saying that we need, we, every one of us need to look at our own personal relationship with the Lord uh, and seek him as to whether we need, what the, the phrase the Lord gave me, if we need to seek him, do we need a course correction, a course correction uh, in our walk with the Lord based on what is coming uh, what we sense is coming in this next year and, and, and probably in subsequent years. Uh, on the 26th of December, the Lord uh, spoke to me and said that uh, there's a, 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 a deep darkness or darkness is looming uh, over America. Uh, there's a, there's a, for, for 2023, there, that I just sense that things are going to be happening in this year and maybe in subsequent years that are going to be dark and in our in our in the relationship that we've had with the Lord in the past that has been sufficient will not be sufficient uh, in the days ahead and so what he wants us to do he wants us to seek him and see if we need a course correction in the way we are relating to to the Lord in terms of how we're seeking him, how we're abiding in him, how we're connected to him. Is, what, is the way we are relating to the Lord sufficient for what is coming? Uh, the scripture verse that, that uh, there were several scripture verses, let me just read these, uh, that, that were really quick and related to this. And the whole issue is the need to, to wake up, to be alert, to be ready 
for what is coming in the, in the years ahead. And let me just read from Isaiah 26, verse 20. I know Donna got it, uh, and Abby got it, and I think uh, Michelle uh, got it as well. And maybe there's, there, there's some others that got this verse when we shared last week. And so, you know, when you have two or three witnesses speaking these words, then uh, there, there's something we need to really pay attention to. But Isaiah 26, verse 20 says, Come, my people, enter into your rooms and close your doors behind you. Hide for a little while until indignation runs its course. For behold, the Lord is about to come out from his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth uh, for the iniquity, and the earth will reveal her bloodshed and will no longer uh, cover her slain. And so he's calling us into, into, a, into the secret place. He said, okay, come into the secret place to be prepared for what might be coming uh, in this day. And so that's where the course correction uh, might be needed is, okay, how do I position myself to come in to that secret place of salvation, that secret place of protection, that secret place of being made ready uh, for what is happening uh, in the earth. Uh, and, and when I say a course correction, I want to make sure we understand this. Um, you know, if, if we're in a ship, say, uh, it's not say a course correction doesn't mean you turn the ship completely around. Doesn't mean that we were all heading in the wrong direction, uh, but now we're, uh, we're going to have to turn around and head in the other direction direction. A course correction can be a minor thing or it can be significant, uh, but you're headed, already headed in the right direction, which I totally believe for our church that everyone in this fellowship is headed in the right direction. You have a heart for the Lord. You, you really want God and you want his best. Uh, but it may be that the way we have related to him in the past is not going to be sufficient for what is coming in the future. And so he wants to bring a correction if it's needed. Uh, I've been seeking the Lord for, for really for several months. There's a Lord, okay, is the way I've been relating to you in my time with you and, and, and with you, is that sufficient for what is coming? And I would just really want to challenge, and I'll talk more about this in just a minute, but I want to challenge everybody to do that uh, because it's been... You know, with the American culture, the, the uh, American lifestyle, where basically, you know, we have everything we need, is, that, is our relationship sufficient if all that's taken away? That, that's what I want to challenge us with. So he's saying, okay, things are going to come, Isaiah 26, things are going to come, but I want, you know, there's a secret place there but there's a relationship required to enter into that secret place. Amen? Amen? So, are you listening? Are you listening? Amen? Okay. okay this is important. The, the other scripture uh, he gave me, one of the other, he gave me Revelation 16, 15 as well, but I won't, I won't read that one. That one, Brian already read that one. But Luke 3, verse 9, Luke 3, verse 9 Indeed, the axe is already laid at the root of the trees so that every tree that does not bear fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Uh, and so I think what he wants to do is he wants to lay the axe to the root, to the church, general church, in the way the church, much of the church is relating to God. He wants to lay the axe to the root, cut it off so that he can rebuild his church in the way it wants to be. Now, he may want to be laying the axe to the root of the way we have been relating to Christ so that he can rebuild it, not to tear us down, but to rebuild it in a deeper way so that we can survive in the days ahead. Amen? Amen. Okay. So let me talk about let me talk about four mindsets that we must examine in our life to see if they are hindering us from going into that secret place. You know, the course, the resetting, a correction of our course. Do we need to do this? And, and uh, I've got four different terms or words. Uh, first one is reputation. You know, reputation 
Reputation, I'm kind of using like, you know, in Proverbs it says wisdom speaks, okay. This is the way reputation speaks. Reputation says things like this. You know, I'm part of a group that is living in this relationship, therefore I need to do nothing different. I'm in a forerunner church. We're discipling pastors. We're doing this or doing that. Therefore, because of this reputation, I'm okay. I don't need to do anything different. That would be Sardis probably more than, you know, that would be the message to Sardis. Or, I use, um, reputation, I used to really seek God fervently and even though it's dulled a little bit, I'm okay because I had this reputation in Bible studies and stuff like that that I was on fire for God. And then there's a third aspect of reputation. You know, I look at my friends and, man, they're not, I mean, they're Christians, but they're not even seeking the Lord at all. And so I have a, my reputation is that I seek. So reputation speaks and it says, because of one of these issues, or it could be other things, I'm okay. I don't need to tweak my relationship with the Lord because of my reputation that I'm counting on that. And it may have been sufficient in, in, in days past, but my sensing is that we're entering into uncharted waters. And we need, we need to avoid the, I'm going to use that. Uh, ship terminology. We're, really, we're going into uncharted waters. I need to avoid the iceberg. I don't want to be on the Titanic. I want to go around that thing, you know, whatever's coming. I don't know what, what's coming. I think the Lord has a warning, but I, there's a word that he gave me that I'll share in a minute that I think of encouragement uh, as well. So, But the first one of these things is reputation. Uh, the second one is tradition. Now, this, this could be, especially for those kind of my age or around my age, this could be a real issue. You know, I was, grew up in the Methodist church and then was a good bit of my adult life was in the Baptist church. And in, in both of those denominations have certain traditions. Uh, you know, I remember more probably for the, from the Baptist church, Methodist church, I wouldn't even, I don't, I don't know where I was in the Methodist church, but I, I, I wasn't seeking God, I know that. But anyway, the Baptist church, I was seeking God, but there's a, there's a tradition associated with that denomination. You know, you're born again, and then you're automatically ready. Uh, you know, if things get tough, don't worry about it, because you're going to get raptured out of there before anything gets, gets too hard. Uh, you know, there's a lot of traditions there. But those traditions affect how much we seek the Lord. Now, y'all listen to me. This is, this is a word for probably several of us. You, you, you know, you, you got this way you've sought the Lord based on the tradition. And then when something comes that might be dramatically different, our traditions say that I'm okay because I've been taught this way from, since, uh, since childhood. There's, um, I don't know how many of you are watching The Chosen. You know, some people like it and some people think it's heresy or whatever, but I, I, I've kind of like it. I mean, uh, there are certain uh, things of it maybe that aren't quite biblical, but th we were watching an episode this week, and Jesus had gone to Nazareth, and he pulled out, uh, they get, handed him the scroll from uh, Isaiah. And so he reads Isaiah 61, uh, which was fine. They loved this reading of the scripture. And, and then he said, that scripture speaks of me. And man, you would have thought <laughs> that the devil himself came into that room in, in Nazareth. Because, you know, they, I mean, that's where he grew up. They had seen him. And what happened there? He came against, he came against their traditions. They were okay that the Messiah is coming. It's just, okay, when Jesus said, I'm, I'm the Messiah, they, were th they couldn't believe it. 
I mean, they had a wrong view of that. They, they were, most of them were looking for the Messiah to be one to free, to free him from Roman oppression. But we can be the same way with traditions. Our traditions can speak all of these things and it, it speaks that you're okay because of what you've been taught traditionally. And the Lord wants us to, to again, evaluate our course. Is, are these things hindering us from being, going deep enough into that room so that when the, all the indignation comes, that we're safe and we're ready and we're alert for what is coming. So that's the second one. The third one uh, is routine. Routine says, I have a certain routine in the way I seek God and the way I have sought him uh, is therefore sufficient. Okay, what are your routines? I hope you have a routine to start with. I mean, I, we all need a routine of seeking God. But what is your routine? Is it to read a devotional? Is it to uh, pray for protection for the day? What is it? And then abide. Do I abide throughout the day? Whatever it is, I mean, and I don't want to put a heavy weight upon people because, you know, I'm, and I, I have this burden for the, the young mom who's like got three kids hanging on her legs and all that, and, and, you know, to try to tell them, okay, you've got to have, you know, a couple hour quiet time every day, uh, you know, is, is crazy. It's just not realistic. So I'm not trying to say what it needs to be or doesn't need to be, but what I, but the, here's what the Lord's been speaking to me about my routine. I mean, I have a certain routine that I've been following for a number of years. And I'm just sensing that, okay, this routine may not be sufficient for what is coming uh, in the days ahead. So ask the Lord. This is all about you going into the secret place and asking the Lord what he wants to do in your life. Is there change that you, that you need to make, do I need to make, for what is coming? Routine. And then the, the last one, we've dealt with this one a lot over the years, and it's, it's, fairly, it's very common, probably in a lot, everywhere, but familiarity. Familiarity listens but doesn't act on what is spoken. Or it doesn't allow the Holy Spirit to speak through the vessel because of who they are. Yeah, we're going back to that chosen episode. I mean, Jesus had grown up in, uh, in Nazareth and uh, he was, that's where he wrote, declared he was as the fulfillment of Isaiah 61. Uh, you know, they just played some sort of little ball game or something in the afternoon and all of that. And, uh, you know, they just saw him as Joseph's son, the carpenter's son, rather than the Messiah. And there was familiarity there. Um, and that can be a hindrance. That can be a hindrance. I mean, some of you have been with us ever since we started the church. And you've heard every word every message I've said and every, everything Brian said and uh, you, you know and it's easy to get familiar with us uh, but and, and it's not just us but you know familiarity with the message familiarity with the with the word the vessel whoever it may be but that can be a real hindrance that can be a real hindrance because it can keep you uh, from responding to the message and see I mean, the purpose of, of messages really are more than anything to stir us to seek God. Uh, I mean, there can be teaching in messages. Sure, certainly they can be that. But a lot of that has to come from motivation to now, okay, God, what are you saying as a result of the message? But familiarity can, you know, make it, that's my brother, you know, that's my son, you know, or, 
miss my dad or well, whoever, you know, whatever it can be. Uh, so anyway, that's the fourth one. Uh, so we've got reputation, tradition, routine, and familiarity are the four that I came up with. And there may be others. But here's the challenge. I think as we begin this year, the Lord wants every one of us to ask him, do I need a course correction in my relationship with the, with the Lord? The way I seek him, the way I have time with him, the way I spend that time with him, how much time I spend with him, and how I abide with him throughout the day. Because remember Isaiah 26, if that word is the word of the Lord for this year, then all of us need to go into that secret place to be prepared to be ready for what is coming. And the way we have related in the past may not be sufficient for what is coming in the future. And he's challenging us today to seek him, do I need a course correction? I don't know if you do or not, but I think wisdom would speak that you need to seek him and ask him and I don't mean just like one fleeting thought. I think you need to take some time, you know, and say, Lord, okay, if all this is really true, do I need, to, do I need a course correction for what is coming? So, amen, amen. Do, um, if it's not too personal, can you share... Anything the Lord has shown you for the course correction as you've been praying, if it's not too personal? Uh, yes. Um, well, I, I can't share. Uh, I don't really know that I have a, an answer yet. But I've been really, the way the Lord's been speaking to me is the, kind of the ways that I've been seeking him, uh, the, the tradition, some of the ways that I have been in my time with him just don't seem to have as much life on them uh, as I used to. And I, it's made me kind of wake up to the idea of maybe the way I've been seeking him in the past is not the way he wants me to seek him going forward. So I've been asking the Lord as a result of that. I'm not, I can't say that I have a, an, an answer yet, though. But that's kind of what, what I've been feeling in that respect. Okay. All right. I want to I want us to pray for for those things for that. Uh, do you have yeah. Yeah, let's uh, we'll, we'll pray corporately while we're still online and then if you want to do anything individual, we'll stop the online. But yeah, I want I want to pray just real quick. Lord, we do let's just pray right now. Lord, we do ask you, Father, for um, Lord that you would you would really Lord, I know, I know like what dad is saying is we need to ask you in our own time with you. But Lord, I pray that this might even be a, a jump start to that time of prayer. Lord, would you show us, Lord, the course corrections we need to make, Lord, in our relationship with you for the, both for the times we live in and both what, Lord, what you are preparing us for, Lord, that we might have those course corrections. Just agree with me if, if you... If you, if you want the Lord to show you uh, what course corrections you need to make, just ask the Lord right now. I'm asking the Lord. Just ask the Lord. Just show us, Lord. Lord, as it relates to familiarity, Lord, as it relates to routine, as it relates to tradition. Uh, what was the other one? As it relates to uh, uh, reputation. reputation. Lord, show us, God, any of those or anything, even, even anything that doesn't fit into those. Lord, show us any course correction that, that we need to make, Lord, as we head into this new year in our relationship with you, that we might fulfill the exhortation of come into the room and hide while indignation passes. I, my, my prayer is that, Lord, we would, we would build our spiritual ark like Noah. I pray, Father, just, just show us, Lord, show us the changes. Show us the things we need to do different. Lord, show us the, the tweaks. Lord, for some it might be 
Lord, repent for this or come out of this or come out of that or establish a routine or whatever it would be. Even the younger people, even those in middle school, high school, just, Lord, if there's not a routine established, that there would be a routine established of seeking you, I pray. Um, Lord, and whatever it is that we would establish that, that, uh, that we would seek you the way, uh, the way you want us to, to seek you. I, I just think of the scripture, um, seek me while I may be found. Seek me in an, in, while I may be found. Then in a flood, basically in a flood of great waters, and, and when, when, the tri, when trials hit, it's going to be harder to seek him. And I just pray that we would take this opportunity. It will never be easier. It will never be easier to seek the Lord and establish that deep relationship with him than it is right now. Lord, may we not squander that. And Lord, may we go deeper and deeper into you, Lord. We pray in the name of Jesus, Father. I think I'll just wait until maybe after we yeah. go off. Okay, so we'll just, for right now, we'll just go ahead and end the online portion. God bless you, and just pray that uh, the Lord will pour out a spirit upon you in 2023. Amen.